Welcome everyone to the EKG case for the week of July 15, 2013. This week's case is actually not a brand new case, but it's actually a continuation of last week's case. I had not originally anticipated doing this, but people sent a handful of emails. People are really interested in getting into the nitty gritty of AV blocks, especially second degree AV blocks. So we're going to do that. And I'll give you the disclaimer right up front that uh, for any of you that are just learning AV blocks, today's video cast may be a little bit confusing, but as you get more comfortable with AV blocks, especially especially second degree, I think this uh, clarification and some more details will be helpful. So anyway, let's, uh, let's get started. So we're gonna start out with just some text slides and then we'll get into some images that'll hopefully make things a bit more clear. We're gonna focus the entire discussion on just second degree AV block and some of the nuances of second degree. So first of all, I think most everybody's comfortable with type one, also known as Mobitz one, also known as Wankybach. But there's a few things that we kind of glossed over last week. One of the things is that in order to call something Mobitz, you need to have a constant P to P interval. You ought to be able to map out those P to P's all the way across the rhythm strip. If you can't do that, well, you're gonna find out next week what the consequences of that are. The PR intervals, as you know, should gradually increase leading up to a non-conducted P wave. All right, everyone's okay with that. Now, one of the other things that I didn't mention, which may be intuitive, but you need to have at least two consecutive PQRS complexes that show an increasing PR. If you don't have at least two consecutive complexes, how do you know that the PR is increasing, right? So it seems kind of self-explanatory, I guess, but we'll, we'll talk about what happens if you don't have two consecutive PQRS complexes? And also, most people make the assumption that Mobitz 1 gives you a narrow QRS, but remember, if a person has a pre-existing bundle branch block, you can have Mobitz 1 with a wide QRS. Uh, usually it's a right bundle, uh, but uh, it can be some non-specific conduction delay as well. Usually it's narrow, but it can be wide if the pre-existing QRS complexes are wide, if there's a pre-existing bundle, bundle branch. Okay, second degree AV block type two, also known as Mobitz two. Once again, you need to have P to P intervals that map out regularly all the way across. If you don't, wait and watch next week. PR intervals are constant, but with non-conducted P waves. Remember, Mobitz one, they are increasing. Mobitz two, they stay constant. You need to, once again, at least have two consecutive PQRS complexes that show a constant PR. If you don't have two consecutive PQRS complexes, how do you know that the PRs would have been constant? How do you know they wouldn't have been increasing? Okay, um, and again, if that's unclear, it'll be clarified when you see an example EKG coming up. And the QRS complexes are usually wide. Now I'm gonna underline repeatedly the word usually. A lot of people assume that if the QRS complex is narrow, it's got to be a Mobus 1, and if it's wide, it's got to be a Mobus 2. That's not completely true. Mobus 2 usually is associated with an infranodal block, which means the QRS complexes are usually wide, but they can sometimes be a bit more narrow. Usually wide, rarely they can be narrow. And vice versa, Mobus 1 can, some, as I mentioned already, can sometimes be wide if there's a pre-existing bundle branch block, and we'll talk about why that's important coming up. Okay, now, what happens if you don't have two consecutive PQRS complexes? Well, in other words, you have a second degree AV block with a two to one conduction ratio. If you have second degree AV block with a two to one conduction ratio, you never have an opportunity to see whether the, QR, the, whether the PRs are increasing and therefore Mobus 1 or whether the, or whether the PRs are staying constant and therefore Mobus 2. So if you have a second degree AV block with a two to one ratio, you're not supposed to try to figure out whether it's a Mobus 1 or a Mobus 2. You're not supposed to call it Mobus 1 or a Mobus 2. So what do you do? You simply call it second degree AV block with two to one AV conduction or, or two to one AV block, all right? Don't bother calling it Mobus, just leave it second degree AV block with two to one, all right? Enough. Okay, let's, um, okay, one more thing that we got to talk about. Some people email, what about this 
thing called advanced or high grade AV block. We didn't talk about that. Most people don't talk about it. It's not that common, but you may occasionally see it. In this particular scenario, you've got a conduction ratio of P's and QRS complexes of three to one or higher. Okay, what does that mean? Normally when somebody has a Mobitz one or a Mobitz two, they have a P to QRS ratio of three to two or four to three or five to four or 10 to nine. Well, what if there's a whole lot more P waves than QRS complexes? You end up with the ratio of three P waves for every one QRS or four to one or 10 to one. Well, that's referred to as an advanced AV block or a high grade AV block. Those can sometimes be type one or type two. Now I'll tell you up front, what I learned in residency was, and from somebody who taught me EKGs was that when you have high grade AV block, they're always type two. That's not correct. And a couple people emailed me about this and I looked it up and they are correct. I was wrong. They are not always type two. Usually 75 to 80% of the time they are type two, but not a hundred percent. You can have a high grade AV block that is type one. And usually these are narrow QRS complexes. You can have a high grade AV block that's type two. And usually those are wide QRS complexes. Okay. So usually they are type two, but not all the time. And I'll tell you where I made the mistake um, in interpreting one of the EKGs last week because of what I learned and, and now I know the truth. All right, so let's look at some, some images here. Here's a second degree AV block type one, also known as Mobus one, also known as Wanky Bach. This is a piece of cake. This is the kind of thing you'd see in a textbook or on the boards. First of all, note again, the P to P interval is constant all the way across. If you use calipers and map this out, it maps out very nicely, all right? There is clearly more than two PQRS complexes where you have an opportunity to see that the QRS or rather you have an opportunity to see that the PR intervals are gradually increasing before the drop. So this is a no brainer. QRS complex is narrow. No problem. Everybody's okay with this one. Type one. Here's your type two. Notice the QRS is slightly wide. It's not a full bundle, but it is slightly wide, which is typical of your Mobitz two or type two. Notice once again, the P to P interval, if you were to map it out, it's completely regular. And notice that your PRs are constant everywhere. And also notice that there's at least two PQRS complexes before each drop. Two PQRS complexes before each drop. Two PQRS complexes before each drop. All right, that's your Mobitz 2. Now, what happens if you don't have two PQRS complexes before each drop? Here's a dropped beat or a P wave that's non-conducted, but there's only one PQRS complex. There's only one PQRS complex before your non-conducted beat. Only one PQRS complex before your non-conducted beat. In other words, this is a second degree AV block with only two to one conduction. There's two P waves for every QRS. Two P waves for every QRS two P waves for every QRS. In this scenario, you really don't have the opportunity to see whether this is a Mobitz one or Mobitz two, because you don't have enough P QRS complexes to map it out and see whether the PR is increasing or staying constant. So when you have a second degree AV block with two to one conduction by convention, don't bother trying to call it Mobitz one or Mobitz two. Simply call it second degree AV block with two to one conduction. Just leave that term, whoop, leave that term in quotes as your final diagnosis. All right, so enough said. And that uh, that hopefully answers some of the emails that had come across. Just leave it at that. Oh, um, one other thing. Sometimes people really have this desire to call things Mobus one or Mobus two. And they'll look at that and say, well, you know, yeah, you can, you can't actually figure out if this is Mobus one or Mobus two, because if it's narrow, it's Mobus one. And if it's wide, it's Mobus two. But you know what? Remember that rule's not a hundred percent. So the major textbook authors, the big wigs say, when you've got second degree AV block with two to one, don't call it Mobus one or two, just call it second degree AV block with two to one. All right. That horse has now been beaten to death. Let's move on. Now let's take a look at this 79 year old man with uh, dyspnea on exertion. And uh, if you notice in the beginning part of his, his rhythm strip, he's got two to one conduction. 
two P waves for every QRS. Two P waves for every QRS. Now, do you just call the second degree AV block with two to one conduction? Well, no, you get to call this something more because when you get to this portion right here, you actually do develop a three to two conduction ratio, all right? Three P waves, whoop, three P waves for every two QRS complexes. And so because of this section right here, you've got a three to two ratio, you get to call this Mobitz. And how do you decide whether this is Mobitz one or two? You take a look at those PRs, you see that they're increasing. Therefore, this is a Mobitz one. Okay, there's also a bifascicular block. We're not gonna get into that, but this is a Mobitz one. And the reason you get to call this Mobitz one is purely because you had a little section where you got to see some three to two. <clears throat> and then you got to make your diagnosis, okay? So, and later on, if you get a long, long rhythm strip, what ended up uh, happening with this patient, it became a very, very obvious Mobitz. The PRs get longer and longer. And so this became obviously Mobitz one later on as well, all right? Take a look at this one. And I have to show you the computer interpretation. Actually, this is the formal interpretation by the cardiologist. Sinus bradycardia with sinus arrhythmia, first degree AV block, wrong, wrong, wrong. That's completely wrong, all right? They obviously didn't look carefully. First thing we're gonna do, we're gonna map out the P waves and the P waves, sure enough, they do map out. The P to P interval stays constant all the way across, all right? And this starts out looking just like a second degree AV block with two to one. Down here, there are two P waves for every QRS, two P waves for every QRS, but in this section right there, it suddenly went three to two. And so because of that section of the rhythm strip, you get to make a diagnosis. And in this particular case, the PR stays constant. When I mapped it out, the PRs, this PR is the same length as that PR. Therefore, you get to call this a Mobus two. So when you look at a rhythm strip and it kind of looks like it's just two to one, and you're resolving to not call it Mobitz, make sure to look at the entire rhythm strip. Get a long rhythm strip because you might actually see a little area where it becomes three to two or some other ratio, and then you get to call it Mobitz something. All right, all right, hopefully I haven't lost people. Let's move on. This is the high grade or advanced AV block. Remember, high grade or advanced AV block is when there's a whole bunch of P waves that are not being conducted. And if we map this out, Take a look, there are three P waves for every QRS. One, two, three there. One, two, three P waves for every QRS. But in this little section right there, there is actually three to two conduction. And if you use calipers, these actually appear to be fairly similar in size. So this is a high grade or advanced AV block with Mobitz two, all right? Um, and there's also a bifascicular block, which we won't get into right now. If this, QR, if this PR interval were increasing, um, and when I, when I measured it, it looked to be the similar, but if it were increasing, then you'd call it a Mobitz 1. So all the usual rules apply. So even with advanced AV blocks, you can have a Mobitz 1 uh, or Mobitz 2. I learned that they're always Mobitz 2. So that's wrong. You can have a Mobitz 1 with an advanced AV block. Okay. Now, Let's, let's go to the, one of the EKGs from last week that Dr. Ben Smedley had sent. And this is uh, one that I got a few emails about. And when I looked at this EKG, interpret, uh, or EKG, I called it a Mobus II. And some people question that and they rightly correct, uh, question that. The reason I call this a Mobus II is, well, over here it looks like there's a second degree AV block with two to one conduction, right? two P waves for each QRS, two P waves for each QRS, two P waves for each QRS. Good, enough. So that's two to one conduction right there. However, there's a PVC there and a PVC there with what I presume is a P wave buried inside it because these map out very nicely, all right? So the P waves map out through the PVCs very nicely. So in my interpretation, and I could be wrong, but in my interpretation, this is a four to one ratio this is a three to one ratio. And that means this is actually an advanced or a high grade AV block. And what I had learned up until this week was that all advanced or high grade AV blocks must be called Mobitz two.
Well, because of your emails, I looked that up and I discovered that I was wrong. You can have a Mobitz 1 with an advanced AV block. So when you look at this EKG, even if this is an advanced AV block with 3 to 1 and maybe 4 to 1 here, all right, um, or maybe you're just going to call it a 2 to 1, how do you know? Is this Mobitz 1 or is this Mobitz 2? Well, um, you'd have to call it Mobitz 2 if this wide QRS complex were new. However, I also showed you an EKG from the same patient where he demonstrated a Mobitz 1 with a right bundle. So in other words, this patient has a pre-existing Mobitz 1. I'm sorry, uh, this patient has a pre-existing right bundle with his Mobitz 1. So it would be reasonable to assume that when this patient went into his advanced AV block, that his right bundle, which was pre-existing, uh, is not due to some infranodal block. And, and I think it's reasonable to assume that this guy actually, um, when he developed his advanced AV block, he actually was still in Mobitz 1 because he's got a pre-existing right bundle. So that's not new. And I'd mistakenly assumed, again, that all Mobitz, uh, that all advanced AV blocks were Mobitz 2, not true. And I'd mistakenly also assumed that if somebody has a wide QRS complex, that it must be Mobitz 2. But that's not true either because uh, it's not true if somebody has a pre-existing right bundle. And this guy we know has a pre-existing right bundle because he had a right bundle when he had his Mobitz 2. All right. And so my thanks to, and I hope I get this name right again, uh, Dr. Jan Stros, uh, who is a physician from the Czech Republic who is heading into cardiology who had, um, he was one of a couple people that emailed me about this, but he, he actually sent me a couple emails. So I figured I would post his name up here. My thanks to him. And uh, because of some emails, I got a chance to, where I was forced to look, look some of this stuff up and had a chance to learn something new. So anyway, uh, some quick take home points. Once again, please remember, if you see second degree AV block with two to one conduction, don't call it Mobus one, don't call it Mobus two, just call it second degree AV block with two to one conduction unless you get a long rhythm strip and you see some areas where it pops into three to two or four to three or five to four. If it does that, then you can clarify whether it's a Mobus one or Mobus two. But if it stays two to one, you can't call it Mobus one or Mobus two. And also remember this entity advanced AV block or high grade AV block. That's when the PQRS conduction ratio is three to one or greater. And that's a type of second degree AV block. And usually you can distinguish a Mobus 1 versus a Mobus 2 in those cases based on whether it's narrow or wide, based on whether it's narrow or there's a bundle. But that's not 100%. If somebody has a pre existing bundle, then it could very well be Mobus 1 as well. All right. So. Hopefully that was helpful. For those of you that are kind of new with EKGs or new with AV blocks or still trying to find your footing with AV blocks, I think this week's is probably going to be a little bit more advanced than you're accustomed to. Um, and, and we'll kind of bring it back down uh, next week. But, um, but there were enough emails out there from people that wanted some more uh, nitty gritty and semantics about some of this that I figured that we would just put a podcast out there or a video cast out there to talk about some of this stuff. And it gets even more advanced than that, but I don't think we're going to bother with those things because this is most relevant to emergency physicians. And uh, anyway, I hope that was helpful. Next week, we're going to talk about PACs, and that's the last part of this AV block thing, PACs. Uh, and uh, in my explanation for PACs, uh, you're going to get a chance to hear why I think that the heart can be thought of very similarly to your home toilet. Sometimes people get a little bit uh, offended by that, especially the cardiologists out there, but they tend to laugh when they hear it. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. But yes, it's true. Once you hear my toilet analogy, I promise you, you will never again mistake PACs for Mobits. And uh, if you do, I will give you a full money back refund on the price of subscription to this video series. All right. So hope that was helpful. And I look forward to talking to all of you next week. Bye for now.